first up, do you want us to introduce our surprise segment? <laughs> Um, Yeah, absolutely. I actually have been looking forward to this segment all week ever since I first saw the product of what we're about to talk about. Um, But today we have a very special guest. The guest is Sabrine Koda, who is the founding director of Muslims Without Borders, the director, I mean, sorry, the founder of Green Scarf Day, which is, by the way, a very awesome initiative that you should all look up if you're at university. And the latest initiative, Tasneem, is... Paper Bag Australia, the Paper Bag Australia. Um, and she's also a community <coughs> activist and I must say uh, some sort of an online activist too, Sabrine. You spend a lot of time on the internet. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Tassim. I'm trying not to. <laughs> she's giving me that look, don't say that part of it. <laughs> Since we've been giving such a thorough resume, should we go into the academics of it all as well? Oh, okay. She, she's, you know those people that deal with drugs? What do they call them? Like I the, think they're the called legal pharma, drugs, pharma something stuff. or the other. I think she's one of them species. Um, <laughs> uh, but Sabrine, what what really, really interested me is um, on the weekend there was um, the Master Chef cook-up, which we'll talk about at the end of the episode because I really liked it. Yeah. Um, but one of the gifts was um, a, a, a paper bag, um, as you'd use a gift bag. Um, and it was actually made of newspapers mm. and a friend of mine won it and then she was kind of Instagramming frantically about it because she said, oh, it's actually made by women in Pakistan. And I'm like, in my head, light bulbs are going off. This is some sort of kind of ethical entrepreneurship or something like that. Mm. What is the Paper Bag Australia? Um, so essentially, the Paper Bag Australia is a social enterprise. Um, and if you're not familiar with the concept of a social enterprise, it's, it's entrepreneurship, but with a conscience. And the idea behind the paper bag um, is that we, first of all, our mission is to advocate for the reuse of discarded materials. So it's a sustainability initiative. Um, But secondly, our second mission is to also ensure that the products that we do make are all ethically made and that they have some sort of a social support function. So at the moment, we're, we're getting all of our products from, as you said, from Pakistan, where there's a women's refuge run by the mother of a friend of mine, actually. Um, And our main products are the bags made from newspaper. Mm. So just let's take a step back. How did this actually start? Because I know you obviously being the founder of Green Scarf Day and the uh, founder of Muslims Without Borders of Australia, um, you actually do have that background when it comes to kind of, I guess, community projects, uh, the ethical, sustainable thing. Mm. What made you actually think of this really interesting initiative? Um, a lot of things, actually. Well, the spark, I guess, was I went to, I visited Bangladesh in January last year. And um, one of the first things I noticed, which absolutely amazed me, was the fact that there was just no plastic bags anywhere. Uh, they, they didn't use plastic bags full stop. Everything was made from, uh, they used bags made from newspaper. They used bags made from magazines. They used chip packets that they sew, they had sewn together to make, you know, grocery bags. Um, the bottom line is they didn't use plastic bags. And to me, coming from a country where we pride ourselves on being environmentalists and, you know, eco-conscious, to see a country that we consider to be third world, third world developing country, to, to be so forward thinking in their um, environmentalism, I guess, that just that just astonished me. But was that it or was it the fact that they just couldn't, I guess, afford plastic bags? I mean, because paper bags to me, when you're mentioning, you know, packets to hold food or groceries, they don't mm. sound very lasting or sustainable in that sense. Um, well, I guess the, the concept behind it, and this is again what, what I saw in Bangladesh, was that like you said, it is. I think a lot of it does have to do with them just being resourceful because of the fact that things would be expensive and so they make do with what they have. Um, so it's, I guess, it's environmentalism that's not necessarily conscious, um, conscious yeah. but it's happening anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right, it's, it's not necessarily, the, the bags themselves probably won't last very long, but you're using pr- things that would have been thrown out anyway. And that's really the core of what we're doing with the paper bag. Mm-hmm. We're using newspapers, which you know, we're throwing out millions upon millions every day and they're just getting discarded. Yeah. Instead of doing that, let's turn them into something functional. Mm. Forget using plastic bags because we don't need them anymore, do we? We can just use these bags and, yeah, they're going to break down, but we're going to have a constant supply because we're always yeah. going to have newspapers. Mm-hmm. And that's really the idea behind it. And especially in countries such as Bangladesh, which um, this is a big kind of generalisation on my mm. end, but maybe they don't actually have kind of recycling initiatives to the extent that we do. So reusing things like, um, you know, a newspaper, which probably ends up in the dump, yep. in something that's actually a product that can be sold, you're benefiting, benefiting the environment and then benefiting these ladies that are probably making an income out of it also. And I'd just like to note as well, I think we'll provide a photo on our Instagram feed, but 
the, the bags that I saw on the weekend, they didn't look like just, you know, a half a cent shoddy attempt at putting some recycled paper together. They actually looked like really professional gift bags that you'd pick up and from pretty a store. sturdy. Like I actually, um, you know, handled one. They look pretty sturdy and they they have cute patterns on it. So you yeah. actually, it's not something that you'd kind of use like half ashamedly. I would actually give that as a gift to someone mm. because it actually looks pretty good. And um, as, as you said, we will be posting a picture. Um, and listeners, if you do want to contribute to this discussion, the number is nine seven five eight double three double nine. That was nine seven five eight double three double nine. If you do have any questions, now Sabrina, going back to the whole, um, I guess the, the, what we're talking about. I actually heard one of um, uh, it was a lecture. I can't remember by who, but he was saying he actually had an international friend visit him, um, and the, they had water bottles and they drank the water and they just discarded the bottles. Mm. And the guy was completely baffled. He was like. Why did you throw that out? And he was like, okay, because it's it's disposable. He's like, but it looks fine. Can't you reuse it? And he's like, yes, I can. But he's like, so why did you throw it out? So he's like, it's disposable. And this concept of disposable actually is a very Western concept mm. that a lot of cultures don't have. So if, for example, you know, a cup or a bottle looks fine and can be reused, why would you want to throw it out? And I think, I guess, it's that thinking that we need to reintroduce into our own lives. That's exactly right. And you've actually hit the nail on the head because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, one of one of the things that really gets to me, and I guess um, it, it's, a, like you said, it's really a very Western problem, is that we are a very, th- we're a throwaway society. We use stuff, we dispose of it, we buy something else, and we don't even think twice about it. Um, I guess the what we're trying to do is to show that through the products that we make, so the bags themselves, they have a function. We can give them onto retailers who will use it instead of plastic bags. But more than that, it's the it's the wow factor. It's the fact that people will look at those bags and like you said, you look at it and go, hey, this is cool. This is different. Like, what is this? And why are you doing it? Um, and that's really what we're trying to do is get people to think about the fact that we have a lot of stuff that we throw out that we don't need to throw out. We can reuse that stuff and make something really sturdy and functional and useful out of it. And in its place, we're stopping the, the use of resources that we don't need to use, such as plastic bags and disposable water bottles. Let's use steel water bottles, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a, a, um, an entrenched idea within collective society that I think we really need to change. And Sabrina, are the people who make these bags only in Pakistan or have, has it sort of caught on in other nations as well? It's it's actually very popular in, in Asia um, generally. I, in India, I think they, they do it quite a lot. In Bangladesh, also, as I said, I, I saw it there were everywhere I went, Pakistan. Um, it's, it's, it is definitely catching on and it's starting to catch on in Western countries as mm. well. Um, so we're really at the start of that movement. Um, but I think over time it will really start to build up. But at mm. the moment, your um, social enterprise outsources mm. this work yeah. to Pakistan. So women in Pakistan are the ones making this. That's right. And do you think that... Are you looking at expanding to other countries? We are, actually. At the moment, we're looking into expanding locally. So we're looking at engaging um, the refugee community in making them. Um, So we're looking at uh, building partnerships with organisations that work with refugees to give them, first of all, a... Um, a, a small income, um, and I guess that's really important for, for people that have come up from traumatic circumstances, um, and just to, to start their journey into into settling into Australia. Um, and we think I think that's really important in, in just helping them kind of move along. Um, so yeah, we're definitely looking at expanding locally. I think that's just such a lovely gesture, and it's so important. I think sometimes to to look beyond the financial and the commercial benefits that you'd be getting out of a business and to instead look at, you know, what you're just referring to now, social and entrepreneurship, ethical dealings, because at the end of the day, we're all part part of one society. It's not just about the individual as much as we're encouraged to think that way at the moment. Mm. So reaching out to refugees, reaching out to migrants, to people who really are in need. um, And there's such a big percentage of that like we often think when we associate poverty with anything we often associate it with overseas or it's far away but you know if you just look at the homeless people in the street and a lot of people who don't even come across as poor are really living under that threshold so the more we do things like your fantastic initiative the more we can cater for other people and the more society altogether becomes a better place to live in no definitely and i i think um 
what I, for me, the most important aspect of this, I guess, is putting the agency back on the consumer. So at the end of the day, as a consumer, are you ethical? Um, and even if, you know, for example, you're not, you know, being exploitative in, in your purchasing habits, how can you make your purchasing habits more ethical? Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, when you do mention countries like Bangladesh and things like that, all I can think of is the factory, right? Mm-hmm. 720 and the numbers are still increasing. Yeah. That went down so that way I can go to Cotton and On and buy clothes on special, right? Mm-hmm. Where does it come, where does this mentality come from that, you know, for example, if, if they were in the same room as me um, and kind of produce something with their blood, sweat and tears, I'd never wear it. But because it's out of sight, out of mind, I'm actually happy with that. And I don't have a problem when, you know, things are, you know, something that might be worth, you know, $20 is brought down to a dollar just so I can have it on special, right? Mm. We're never happy with these conditions. How come when it's out of sight, out of mind, as as people, we're actually consciously and ethically okay with that why is that the case and i I guess it's bringing the agency back to the consumers you you can't detach yourself from it so when you see the you know it's it's sad that it's taken you know a factory on 720 people or more to actually die for that point to hit home but that's the reality of what we're facing Mm, that's exactly right and um you know as you said out of sight out of mind because we don't see it we don't um we just basically ignore it. Um, and when unfortunate circumstances like what happened in Bangladesh happen, that's when we open our eyes. The unfortunate thing is as humans, we tend to forget and we go on with life. And um, it's very easy to go back to buying, you know, what's on special at Cotton On or whatever. Not that I'm saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, it, you forget. You yeah. forget what you need to do. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important for more social enterprises to come up First of all, tackling these sorts of issues, not only from an environmentalist perspective, from a social perspective. And I think the key the key thing to really understand is that the not-for-profit model has been going on for a very long time and it does do some great work, but it's not sustainable. And that's where social enterprise comes in. Um, as you said, you, you it is, it's great that you can see people that can think beyond profit and are looking to make social impact. But it's it what's more important that more important than that is making sure that that social impact is financially sustainable in the long term. And social enterprise is just such a great way of making sure that that happens. Yeah, you have a very good point because I think even just looking at it on a local scale with volunteers, for example, just in the Muslim community, yeah. yeah. After a while, you have to start working jobs. Mm-hmm. That will actually provide you with some kind no, not, of income not and support. Not only the volunteers, right? But you know, every time someone wants money, it's like a it's a dinner, right? Fundraising dinner. There's probably sixty mm. million that happens this month, and there's another sixty million coming, right? Um, I guess if we start our frame of mind changes so that way okay we do need money and obviously whether it be social enterprise or other other initiatives you're producing money right so instead of kind of doing it the usual dinner where you you know 90 percent of profits goes to the to the food and the reception Mm -hmm. and 10 percent goes to you know the people that you actually need to benefit change the model around so that way as you said for example something that can be you know help refugees help ethical consumerism um, and actually create change at the same time is actually put, lumped into the one. So mm. I think that's a really good concluding message that we'll leave it with. So for those of you who are kind of, you know, eager to change the world, think of little creative ways that you can actually change the world that would bring smiles to your face and doesn't necessarily involve, you know, sometimes when we think let's change the world, you just think, you know, oh, I don't know, let's go on starvation um, mm. and, you know, just... <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that we'll later. Get to the, we'll get to starvation, right? But sometimes something as enjoyable as making gift bags to sell to people that bring joy to people can actually be really um, successful. I think once everybody pulls out the butcher paper and comes up with some good ideas, I would love if you would pitch them to the Y Factor and if you guys need any help at all with setting up a social enterprise maybe we can put you in touch with someone who's experienced as Sabrine definitely now Sabrine um just to conclude if those uh, if anyone wants to actually either purchase your paper bags or learn more about it where should they go um so you can go to our Facebook page which is facebook.com forward slash the paper bag Australia um we've also got a website www.thepaperbag.com.au but it's currently under construction so if you go onto it it's kind of only half finished um so they're the two main two main areas. But, yeah, you can go online and you can either buy a bag or support us in some way um, and find out more. Excellent. Sabrina, it's been our pleasure. And hopefully, you know, you've been an inspiration for more, I uh, guess, what was the word? Social? Social enterprises, social entrepreneurs. No worries. <laughs> to, to kick off and launch up in the community. Guys, you're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. We're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM. And I just said that and I said it twice. <laughs> I 
How beautiful is this worldly life But not a soul shall remain We've all come into this world Only to leave it one day I can see that everything around me Rises then fades away Life is just a passing moment Nothing is meant to stay This worldly life has an end And it's then real life begins A world where we will live forever This beautiful worldly life has an end It's just a bridge that must be crossed To a life that will go on forever So many years quickly slipping by like the sleepers of the cave Wake up and make a choice Before we end up in our graves You didn't put me here in vain I know I'll be held accountable for what I do This life is just a journey And it's taking me back to you oh, oh. This worldly life has an end A world where we will live forever This beautiful 